everyone, my name is T and I'm on the Vancouver Startup Week team. Um, before we begin, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge that we are grateful to be virtually gathered on Indigenous land, regardless of where you are joining us from. I'm grateful to be on the traditional, ancestral, and unstated territory of the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish peoples. I'm privileged to live, work, and play on these lands. I'd like to thank you all for joining us for BSW 2021, and welcome to Scaling and Financing the Circular Economy, hosted by Vancouver Economic Commission. The session is also part of the VSW Growth Track and is proudly supported by Innovate BC. Innovate BC is a crown agency that provides small business around the province with funding, business coaching, and educational content. They're helping entrepreneurs and founders start and scale their businesses and adapt to the changes brought on by COVID-19. So if you're looking for support for your business, make sure to stop by their booth to learn more about how they can help. Um, and if you have any questions for our speakers, please post them in the Q&A uh, portion of the Hoopa session. And you can also upvote comments, questions. Um, but now I'll pass the mic over to Brianna and we'll begin the session. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Brianna Bishop and I work at the Vancouver Economic Commission. It's my pleasure to welcome you to our panel session this afternoon, Scaling and Financing the Circular Economy. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the land that I'm joining this panel from, as well as where the VEC is located, are on the traditional and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. The Vancouver Economic Commission is the economic development agency for the city of Vancouver, with the purpose to contribute to building a prosperous, inclusive, zero carbon and resilient local economy competitively positioned in a global market. Before we dive in, I'd like to thank Vancouver Startup Week for the opportunity for us to host this panel on the circular economy. I'd also like to welcome our panelists, Amelia Elita, co-founder and CEO of dBrand, Felix Fox, founder and CEO of Top Value Microfactory, and Tom Bodez, uh, partner at Active Impact Investments. Perfect. A few housekeeping items. Uh, first, please interact with us in the chat. We wanted, we'll answer as many questions as we can. The chat, as uh, T mentioned, is being monitored by um, herself, as well as um, my colleague, Meg Oshie Shea from the VEC. Uh, we'll have 10 minutes for each presentation before we head into Q&A, uh, which will leave a few minutes for concluding remarks. We have an expert panel with us today to discuss scaling and financing the circular economy. The circular economy is an economic model that extends the life cycle of products. Throughout this process, waste is eliminated through the reduction, reuse, repair, and recycling of materials to limit inefficiencies and close gaps within the system. It aims to effectively design out waste. There's a need for circular transformation across every sector and industry, creating new opportunities across all supply chains. According to the Circular Gap Report Initiative, as of 2020, less than 10% of the world is circular. Clearly, there's nothing but opportunity awaiting innovators and entrepreneurs bringing the circular economy solutions to market. Today, we'll focus our conversation on scaling and financing circular businesses and hearing from those who have been successful. Diving into the opportunity within the circular economy, the importance of working collaboratively, scaling with software, scaling with different business models, and an overview of the investment ecosystem and the opportunity financiers are seeing within circularity. Uh, our first panelist is Amelia Lee, co-founder and CEO of dBrand. With an entrepreneurial spirit running through her blood over the past 15 years, Amelia has co-founded two scaling businesses, one industry stakeholder group, and a micro loan program in Sri Lanka. In all of her endeavors, she's guided by a passion to help unlock the highest value of our world's people and its resources. As dBrand's CEO, she provides strategic leadership in the areas of company vision, sales, marketing, human resources, and finance. As a pioneer in the space of reverse logistics, dBrand works uh, with many of the world's most notable apparel brands, including Vancouver-based stars, including Lululemon Athletica, Aritzia, Herschel, Hidden Ace, Oakenfort, and many more. Amelia, I'll pass it off to you. Great. Thank you, Brianna. And thank you, Vancouver Startup Week, for, for having us here today. It's, it's really exciting to be a part of the local community and, and um, super excited to be co-presenting with Felix and Tom. So thanks for having me. So yeah, like unfortunately, I don't have any slides. Um, I was kind of late to the party on that one and, and didn't realize till late last night that that was something I could have done. So I apologize. We'll have to envision, hopefully, I'll try to create a bit of a descriptive story where I can. Um, but yeah, I usually like to start uh, just by sharing a little bit of our origin story. Um, and, and I'll sort of hopefully that'll create a bit of a thread of, um, of why we do what we do and, and where we sort of recognize that 
this wasn't just an idea that we had, but a hopefully what's going to be a very successful financial endeavor as well, um, driving the circular economy. Um, that's It's now called, which is really cool. It didn't really have a name back in the day. So now it's not only have we named it reverse logistics, but also the circular economy. So I feel grateful that I have something to describe my, my industry and business by. So I guess going back to the origin story, I, I started my career working for a marketing agency in Vancouver. And uh, Nike Canada was actually my, my only client there. I was with them for five years. So it was a really great opportunity from a really young age, like right out of fresh out of university of diving into this global brand and learning from a lot of really amazing people on just the power of the brand and how much money resources goes into developing that image and, and what that iconic swoosh um, really stands for and, and just how much we need to do to protect the brands that we create. So that was really imprinted on me at a really young age. Um, so as I moved on in my career, I, I left that role and found myself volunteering um, in Sri Lanka, actually, after, uh, after the tsunami had hit in the mid 2000s. I guess I was one of those people that I I was remember, I remember sitting at my desk um, and and uh, you know nothing wrong with sitting at a desk I'm sitting at one right now actually but I was sitting at that desk and I was I had this little picture um, sort of in the side of my cubicle and it said it was a little picture of some young girls from Africa and it, it said what if it was you what if what if you never had the chance to become something better and I I think I'd seen it actually at the Nike World Headquarters um, during one of my trips there and I'd taken a picture of it and I, I left it on my desk and. I always looked at it and just said, you know, I'm so fortunate um, to be born into, you know, the country that, you know, being born into Canada and, you know, the family infrastructure that I had growing up was very entrepreneurial and um, gave me a very good foundation. And I just felt like maybe I needed to do something different and, and bigger um, with my career and with with my time here on, on, on earth, really. And so I, I sought out this adventure in Sri Lanka. And while I was there, I, there was actually not a lot because the civil war was really rampant at that time. A lot of the work that I was, had gone there to do was quite slow to progress. And so I spent a lot of time um, surfing actually. <laughs> and uh, my now business partner, uh, he used to work for me at that marketing agency, Wes came to visit. And it was on this surf trip that, um, and I think Tom may have heard the story, but um, I uh, it was on this surf trip that I sort of had that aha moment. I was coming out of the water and Wes said, hey, Amelia, there's, uh, there's something on your leg. And I thought, oh, it's just seaweed or something. Well, it wasn't seaweed. It was a soda wrapper from a pop bottle. And it had a brand name on it. And Wes at the time had sort of been doing some design and engineering work for some of the brands that we, we had the fortune of meeting through our time at that agency. And um, was like, you know, I feel like there's a better way to build things and a better way to like decommission things after they're no longer useful as in, you know, in their original purpose. So we ended up having this idea that one day this brand, the fact that these, this brand name was floating in the ocean and somewhere it shouldn't be was going to matter. And so this, there was this big idea born of how do we, how do we help? How do we make a difference? And it really, that's what sparked the innovation, I guess, or the idea behind what we do today with dbrand um, and came back. And a lot of people said, Oh, that's a really nice idea. Um, good luck making a business out of it. And I was like, what? what like people are going to care about secure disposal, like making sure we can get rid of stuff in a responsible way. So I was really set in my, my vision, um, you know, for the first couple of years, we were lucky that we had the Vancouver Olympics um, here in 2010. And so I just pounded the pavement and started talking to a lot of the sponsors of those games. And, you know, the mayor at the time, Gregor Robertson, really wanted it to be the greenest, greenest games in the world. And so I went to these big sponsors and said, you know, at the end of the Olympics, what are you going to do with all those assets that you've built? Because they have the Olympic rings on it. They've got your brand name. And so what I ended up doing was um, just pitching this idea of like, let us decommission all of your, your branded assets. And that's really was this, the foundation of dbrand was let us dbrand it for you and then recycle and, and repurpose the parts. And it worked, it worked really well. We got a lot of business in those first couple of years. Um, we were super stoked. We we're like, okay, we're onto something here. This is gonna work. And, and then the Olympics were over. And then we realized, oh, that was, that was a really good run, but how do we build this into a like recurring revenue into a, a business that can actually be scalable? Because what we were finding was that the materials that we were handling and the items that we were dealing with, it was really hard to build systems around. 
because we'd get anything from like a random trade show booth to sometimes like the film industry in Vancouver would call us and say, we have sets that we need to get rid of. Well, we could do that, but how do you build and scale for that? Um, so we were really perplexed about how to make this actually happen. And so, and at the same time, we got kicked out of the first little office space that we, we leased. We actually leased it in Yale town of all places in the, it wasn't luxurious though, it was the basement of the Royal Bank there um, on mainland, um, no windows. It was 700 square feet <laughs> and it was had a roll top door and they kicked us out because they were building a bank because it wasn't a bank at the time. So we said, okay, well, we're either gonna do this or we're gonna close up shop. And, um, and we really wanted to do it, but we just weren't sure. We had no recurring revenue. So we were kind of in a tough spot because we needed to move locations. So I remember talking to my, my older brother who's a, much more successful technology entrepreneur. And he said to me, he's like, you know, Amelia, like you could close up shop now and just call it a day, or you could, or, but how would you feel if in 10 years from now, um, or 13 years in this case, it's been 13 years now, um, someone else was doing what your vision was? Like, what if, what if someone else fi figured this out and did it and stuck with it and now they're here and they've been really successful? Would you be able to live with yourself? And I was like, oh crap, no, I can't. I've got to, I've got to try. So anyway, that's the sort of the long winded origin story, but we ended up um, signing a lease, a long term lease with a space in Vancouver, had no recurring revenue. I have no idea what we were thinking because we <laughs> I don't even know why they let us get it, actually, because we had no money. But I, I mean, things were different then. They, we, we were allowed to sign on the lease and we started our business. And what what we realized is we needed to narrow our focus. Um, we were too wide. So we really narrowed in and we were fortunate that we were introduced to Lululemon at that time. And Lou Lemon came to us and said, you know, um, we love what you're doing, but we actually have a need for our products, our damaged goods, this whole world of, it was sort of a hidden secret a little bit that there was all these damages and returns that were coming back um, that just didn't have a home and they couldn't sell them. So they said, if you can find a solution for these goods, um, we're not alone in our need for this. So we said, okay, let's, this is scalable. We can create systems around it. We can offer it to all these other apparel brands. We'll be set in three years. We'll be ready to go, you know? Well, three years passed and we, we grew a little bit, <laughs> but the appetite wasn't really there. Um, so we, we had a clear vision, but we really had to, I guess we just had to persevere a lot through those years. We've been around for 13 and a half years now. And, um, you know, it looks, I, I think where the market is right now, there's this big tsunami of sustainability and circularity um, happening. And in many ways, you know, we were early, but it really allowed us to, to envision where we wanted this industry to go and where we wanted to solve for. So where we are today, 13 years later, is we work with a lot of different brands, as Brianna mentioned, um, we, we did some, because we were early, we had the opportunity to sort of analyze the market and see where the bottlenecks were going to happen and try to prepare and plan for that and figure out, be really, really crystal clear on where our vision was. And while there's all this stuff movement around us, we wanted to stay very focused on where, what we wanted to be best in the world at. And that was in sortation. Um, and it doesn't sound very sexy, but what we're doing is we're building a software mm -hmm. platform um, to be able to, it's an allocation engine. And what it does is it allows us to digitally scan items that are returns or um, take back program items, things that come back through the brand's inventory. And we're able to automatically allocate those to their highest and next best use. So this software really enables the whole circular economy to be more cost-effective, efficient, um, and allows our brands to extract as much value as possible um, from those products and materials. We're expanding into the US right now. Um, we have an operating agreement with waste management um, out of the US. So we're operating within two of their facilities, one in South Carolina and one in Arizona. We're using our technology and our system. So it's really exciting time for us. Um, and yeah, I don't know. I guess you'll probably ask a few more questions later about um, the, how the financial side of things went, but that's sort of the origin story and, and our growth story um, to date. Perfect, thank you so much. And our next presenter will be Felix. Let me share my screen there. Uh, Felix founded a Chop Valley Microfactory Franchise Concept, uh, where he developed an innovative closed loop engineered material. Motivated to create a global impact in the bamboo industry, he's gained experience by working on projects supporting companies of all stages in over 20 countries with his firm Crosslink Technologies. 
Under Felix's leadership, his team at Chop Value has discovered a powerful way to connect the circular economy to his expertise in wood and bamboo composite materials while he completed his PhD in collaboration with UBC, MIT, and Cambridge. He believed that by leading by example with innovation and resilience uh, will inspire others to rethink resource efficiency and reshape the future of urbanization. Felix, I'll pass it off to you. Thank you so much. Well, that was a very exciting introduction. I, I had to smile a bit because I always say uh, all I actually am is, is a garbage man. And I, I never know why I'm getting invited to panels that talk about scale, because all I'm talking about today is the humble little chopstick and what we try to do in showing how simple and tangible and relatable the circle economy, um, circle economy truly should be. And uh, that's what I'm hoping I can share a little bit uh, about. And I'm also pretty excited that Tom goes last because I think uh, the Vancouver Startup Week is all about uh, so many young entrepreneurs who are you know, dying to get answers about how do I get funded and how can I grow? So uh, if, if I would be uh, listening today, I would be so excited about uh, Tom uh, um, going, going last in our session. And I hope we can have a lot of uh, conversations around that as well. Um, so are you um, showing the slides for me, Brian? And um, um, I'll just give you a little uh, sign when, uh, uh, when I'm ready for the next slide. Is that okay? Awesome. Well, that's, that's a great service. Um, haven't done that format before. So I'm happy if you wanna go to the next slide because this is uh, truly um, uh, where the story started. So uh, um, I'm a German wood engineer. Um, and uh, uh, when I moved to uh, Canada, um, I, I had the chance to actually get involved in the local industry because, um, uh, you know, immer emerging yourself in, 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 in with local relationships and the local network in the industry, um, I, was, I was very motivated to not just be narrow-minded in my field of subject, in my field of research in, in, in bamboo. I was actually motivated to understand the local um, uh, research as well. And uh, I joined a few team members uh, to the landfill and uh, I'm, I'm so glad I did that day because I returned back to the university from that little field trip so frustrated and so angry and so upset because that was the picture I took with my little iPhone 4. And um, that picture is probably one of the most used picture on all of the slides. So, you know, uh, actually great technology that this iPhone 4 took such a great picture because um, this is truly the, 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 the inception moment. Um, some that, that many entrepreneurs probably tell you a story about of uh, many stories start with a little bit of frustration. And for me, the frustration was that someone in our industry is defining wood as a waste product and it ends up on a landfill. And I grew up uh, always getting reminded that wood is a natural material and should never ever be defined as waste. It's always a resource and then at the, at the end of its life, it's still a resource um, for energy. So I was, just, I was just standing in front of that and seeing that, that wood waste on the landfill. And I learned later on that we are um, generating 400 to 600,000 tons of wood waste from the demolishing housing market in Metro Vancouver alone. And uh, you know, everyone who is hearing that number don't, doesn't really understand that number because there's no emotional connection to what 600,000 tons actually means. So if you're going to the next slide, what I thought I could uh, probably do is create a very, very small and simple and inspiring story that could potentially resonate with everyone. And I'm tackling that waste problem that we have in our urban environment, one chopstick at a time. So that didn't only sound stupid now, that also started, uh, sounded stupid on day one. It sounded stupid at dinner when I told my girlfriend about it. It sounded stupid uh, pretty much at every conversation that I was, especially when um, maybe you, you know that moment when you talk to maybe your boss or at, at that point it was my professor and I told him, Greg, hey, I have this idea. You know, you know how I'm doing this research with, with composite materials for the automotive industry and what if we could actually add another story to the component. And we, we actually use these, these chopsticks that we're throwing out because it's the perfect fiber. It's the perfect raw material. When you look at it from an engineering perspective, it has a defined length, it's had, it has a defined diameter. It's very dry, it's very clean from an engineering perspective. And 
do you know that feeling when you look at someone and they look right through you and they're already at the at another topic because they think you they this guy is totally crazy i had these moments probably a thousand times <laughs> until today um but i thought there is something and that story might be actually something that every one of us understands and have, coming from an engineering background and having an understanding what many other companies are going through when, when it comes to new product development and, and scalability, I got really motivated and I got really excited. And all the people that look right through me and did not really understand what I'm talking about taught me that if I don't do it, no one else will do it. So if you're going to the next slide, you will actually see that how we tackle it was coming up with a solution of creating with something that is of lowest value, completely neglected and underutilized, like the small little stupid chopstick. Something really, really high valuable and beautifully designed and super innovative, high performing material. That was the goal, to create your, your, your value chain and your innovation within the process itself. And I think that's, that's a key learning um, for myself when it comes to circular economy. When I started Chop Value, full disclosure, I did not use the term circular economy. I did not know the term circular economy. I actually started a company because I was so passionate about creating this new beautiful material. And then by listening to, to all of you experts and, and, and understanding what the community was craving, more sustainable solution, waste reduction, and the path from a linear to a circular economy, taught me that chop value might be a really, really easy and simple to understand example for, um, for, for that thought leadership component uh, within the circular economy. Maybe you can go to the next slide because I think it's my favorite, if I have it in my memory. Yes. So now we are tying together um, innovation of a small, humble idea to, to business. And this is a slide I wish I would have had on my first day or maybe in the first year of business, but this is actually a slide I just came up with a year ago because every business is looking for this hockey stick curve um, that explains your growth. We can actually look at this hockey stick curve within our process. So um, what I mean by that is, um, so if you, if you wanna take a screenshot of a picture of any slide today, please look at this slide because it's the coolest slide. Um, the 100 billion chopstick business opportunity. That's our goal. We're not talking about dollars right now. We're just talking about the resource potential of how many chopsticks we're importing every single year to North America. That's crazy. 100 billion chopsticks. But now, if you're looking at it as a waste product, it's worth nothing after these 20 to 30 minutes of use that you're throwing them out. If you're, if there's this crazy German guy coming there and, and says, this is a new resource for new engineered material. You have defined it as a resource, but it's still worth nothing because you haven't started yet. The moment you're putting these chopsticks into a bin and you're coming up with a program, how to actually gather that material for your business. That's the first time you're putting a dollar amount to that resource because you're putting labor into it, you're putting, you, you're putting a carbon footprint around your pickup route and you're defining this now as a raw material that you can give a price tag now because you can calculate it. And what we have done, we try to position our end product in a way that the, the, this, this, this hockey stick curve that you're trying to look for in, in business, we're, we're having a multiple of 148 from raw material to the end product on the market. So I guess I would have failed if, I, if my goal would have been making toilet paper out of chopsticks because there's, that, that would have not been the same um, value creation from raw material to the end product. One key thing in the circular economy. And I think I would have, would have also failed in that scale of business if my um, end product would have been a flooring tile because you know from a flooring tile, it's not, it's not a defined end product it's maybe something that people would look at as $5 per square foot. So your value chain um, uh, or your, 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 your value proposition isn't as, um, uh, as steep as we can uh, achieve here from a raw material all the way to the end product positioning. Um, so you can go to the next slide. Um, and uh, 
it's one of these big statements that, that, that we have um, that we usually um, teach every end consumer, every uh, business partner, every supplier, that every single product in general has an impact. It can have a positive impact, it can have a negative impact, it can have a neutral impact, has an environmental impact, a social impact. And I feel like with Chop Value, what we really learned is we have a huge educational impact on, on, on that educational piece of our brand with every single purchase decision, um, we, we actually allow our story to travel and educate others um, about a true example of what circular economy is all about. Um, maybe you, maybe I have one more slide. Um, so we try to break down all the complex issues in a, in a very, very simple example and kind of challenge the norm, the norm of how to do business, the norm how to, um, how to tell people uh, on, on how much it costs to get started to, to run your own business. Because we really want to make sure we can lead by example to, to make circle economy the norm. So all we do within our locations is we recycle chopsticks, we produce locally in micro factories, and we create minimalistic design and then distribute these product, products locally. So um, maybe a final note on, on how we scale. Um, for, for everyone who is, who is interested in that is um, my biggest motivation was having a, a, a great idea, an exciting idea that, that many people um, can relate to and understand is something you should not hold on to yourself and then just uh, scale the traditional way and hold on to everything. I feel like that's a very short-term thinking that doesn't have an impact on the greater system. So what we try to do is we try to find a way and a mechanism how we can bring our micro factory concept that recycles, produces, and distributes product locally, wherever you are. That means if we can do that in Vancouver, in such a challenging and expensive market, why can we not do that in Calgary? Why can we not do that in Toronto? Why can we not do that in New York or in San Francisco? And then I also heard that in Tokyo, there are a lot of chopsticks. So obviously we, we, we can really now expand our horizon on, on, on thinking, why did I have to come up with this idea um, as, as a guy who hasn't even eaten with chopsticks until 2011? <laughs> and, and, and why have I seen this problem um, as an exciting example and journey to scale impact within the circle economy? And this is what we're trying to answer with, with, with our brand and, uh, and uh, super excited to work with all these amazing people and expansion partners. You know, just like Tom, um, who is who is speaking now uh, right after me. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Felix. And uh, as Felix mentioned, our final panelist today is Tom. Uh, Tom's a partner for Active Impact Investments, a certified B Corp whose mission is to support environmental sustainability through profitable investment. With two limited partnership funds with over 50 million in assets under management, Active Impact provides a talent to accelerate the growth for early stage climate tech companies between 200,000 to 3 million uh, in revenue and significant growth potential. Active Impact's portfolio includes and is seeking some of the most successful startups in North America that are capable of achieving venture scale and becoming extremely profitable while solving the most urgent environmental issues. Tom spent 27 years practicing tax law with Thorstensen LLP, Canada's leading tax law firm, including a tenure as managing partner. Tom, I'll pass it off to you. Thank you, Brianna. 27 years. I must have started when I was about eight. Um, thank you for the introduction, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak on this panel with two very inspirational uh, business leaders in the circular economy space. Interesting to hear how neither of them knew or they were circular economy when they started, and uh, now that it's the rage, they're, they're leaders in the space. Um, so we can just uh, go to the next slide, please. So who are we, Active Impact, and where did we come from? So you heard I spent a long time as a tax lawyer, which doesn't have a lot to do with, uh, with, with what we're talking about today. And Mike Winterfield, who is my partner and founder at Active Impact, also had a, a lengthy career doing things that, that didn't have to do with what we talked about today. 
So we were two guys who were environmentalists in our personal lives and were uh, busy being successful in careers that really didn't move the needle on climate change at all. And both just got to the point of uh, asking the question that uh, mentor Joel Solomon at Renewal Funds asks in his book, Clean Money, how much is enough? And neither of us are, are, are people who uh, uh, are very materialistic and could answer that question like, well, we're already there. We, we have a house we're happy with. We, have, we don't need anything fancier. And really like when you get to that point, why would you do anything that you don't feel is um, you know, fulfilling and contributing to society and, and, and makes you feel good about what you're doing. So that's when we thought, okay, well, we have to do something about the, the climate crisis. We can, we can see as we learned more about it that um, it's, it's an urgent issue and, and what can we do to combine our skills? So you know, Mike is a guy who is, uh, has lots of experience in scaling companies in his past and is a fantastic uh, resource when it comes to sales and and um, you know staffing and human resources and just scaling companies generally. Um, in in my background, I was an advisor to a, you know some of the biggest companies and families you would know and saw how they operated, and um, also uh, you know allows me to have access to sources of capital. So we kind of put those together to build the fund and. Um, Brianna, you mentioned 50 million. We're having we're having a good couple of days. It's actually 60 million now, so we're <laughs> we're doing well in terms of of uh, fundraising to to get funds to deploy into into what we're doing. Um, so, um, what are we doing? Uh, it's on this slide here. Provide funding and talent to accelerate the growth of early stage companies to achieve venture scale profit while solving the most urgent environmental issues. You solve a big problem, you get a big return. Biggest problem out there is climate change. If you're supporting entrepreneurs who are moving the needle on that, why wouldn't you expect to, to also have a profitable company and, and be able to return that to the investors? Uh, we're focusing on a few key areas. So clean energy and transportation, building infrastructure, food and water systems, and the topic of this panel, circular economy. So maybe next slide, please. So as Felix mentioned, the uh, take make waste linear model is what we've been looking at for a long time. I think your iPhone 4 might be in that pile there in one of those uh, cartoons there, Felix. Um, and when I think of the circular economy, I, I, I like to think of the big picture, sort of the history of, really big picture, I guess, history of economic and industrial development. And this is a problem that has only existed for really an infinitesimal peace period of world history, like less than two generations ago. Um, that's when humanity kind of adopted what seemed like, you know, let's, here's some smart new products and technologies that are promising a simpler, more convenient lifestyle for everybody and lots of consumer options. And isn't this great? In fact, um, you know, plastic production, for example, that only really became wide scale after the end of World War II. So we're talking about a fairly short period of time that the problem uh, arose. Um, and in that period of time, like as we know, the world's bought into the paradigm of, you know, produce it, market it, consume it, throw it away, and repeat. Uh, but of course, uh, there is no, there is no away. Uh, whenever, whenever you, a uh, few people stop to ask, when we say throw it away, like, where are we talking about when we say away? Uh, we only have, there's only one planet that we have for a home. And the waste is piling up right here on our home planet. There is no way. So circular economy solutions look to change that and they reduce the amount of raw materials that are going to be consumed and the amount of waste produced through reuse or repurposing of that waste. So for example, uh, in the case of, uh, I'll use Felix as an example, a chop value, a humble chopstick otherwise thrown away. Instead, it gets to live on as a gorgeous table and the tree that would have been used to make that table gets to live on in the forest. Next slide, please. So in terms of the, the Vancouver investor ecosystem to, to support uh, companies of this nature uh, and, and earlier stage companies, because we've got two uh, more experienced entrepreneurs here today, 
Um, you know, the, the incubators and accelerators and, uh, uh, in town are, are great. Um, and, and of course, there's non dilutive grant financing for building a business. Uh, and I'm happy to, you know, talk to people more about all of those, but you know, Creative Destruction Lab, Spring, there's probably others that I haven't put on my slide, uh, are, are great places to sort of go and, 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 and you know, get your feet wet and, and, and figure out some of the things you, you need to figure out to get going. And then um, there's also a strong network in Vancouver and beyond of you know, angels and family offices that are becoming you know, more and more interested in investing in this space. I hear from them a lot. Some of them want to invest uh, when it comes to like family offices or foundations. Some of them want to invest through a fund like ours and, and not do the, do the due diligence themselves, but there's a lot of them that, uh, that wanna, wanna invest direct. And then uh, I guess one step up from that, you get to you know venture capital firms uh, such as our own, and I've listed some others there uh, that have a local presence that are that are the good ones to go to uh, if you're looking for funding in this space. But um, I guess I'd, I'd I'd really want to say like for, for for founders that are seeking financing, and you may have heard this before. I'm sure you probably have, but you really want to think carefully about who you have, who you want to have on, on your cap table. We're talking about a marriage here that's going to be in place for a while. So you want to make sure that the investor is aligned in terms of values to your circular economy objectives, if that's that's your, your business. And, and ideally, in addition to being aligned with values, provide some strategic or operational help that um, in your growth journey. Right, next slide, please. So as one of the Vancouver-based BC firms that, that were on that slide that are, that are you know, firms actively interested in circular economy companies, what are we looking for? Uh, we, are, um, we focus more on sort of late seed and early series A companies. Uh, we're not likely to look and invest at a company pre-revenue. Uh, we like to lead the seed rounds. We um, will invest alongside values aligned leads in a series A round. And, now that we've raised our, our second fund, which is, is, is larger, uh, we're, we're, we're writing bigger check sizes than we were out of fund one. So you know, our initial check size would be like 750,000 to 1.5 million, somewhere in that range, depending on, on what makes sense for the stage of the company. And then of course, saving money for follow-on investment as well. The reason why we wanna stay at this stage and not sort of go to companies further along is this is the stage that's, that's a good fit for us. You know, I talked about Mike's experience, for example, um, you know, sales, talent attraction, team building. There's a lot of companies at an early stage where maybe they have, you know, great founders and a, a great idea. And, you know, sometimes they think, well, <laughs> I have a great, I have a great idea. The market's just going to come to me. But as, as Felix said, <laughs> well, it doesn't quite work that way. And it's it's uh, it's hard work to uh, to to uh, make sure that the market knows about you and to and, and to make sales. So uh, that's an area where where Mike can can be quite helpful and the rest of the team that we're now building as well and to help scale businesses. So that's the stage it makes sense for us. We're active partners. We're looking to do we'll do whatever it takes really to help every one of our portfolio companies succeed. Like knock on wood, um, so far, you know, one of our big, hairy, audacious goals is, is no failed startups. And we have 15 investments in fund one, and, and they're, they're all, we have no failed startups as of you know, three and a half years in. So, so far, so good. Uh, it's a little different model than, than some big VC firms where they only want to support the winners. Um, we want all of our companies to succeed. And when we're choosing investments, we're looking at impact first. We're looking for founders that are values aligned, founders that can quantify the environmental impact that they have currently, as well as the impact that they, they think they could have when their business is, is scaled to the size they think it can get to. And GHG emission reduction is of course, like that's, you know, that's our most important goal really as a fund to, to reduce that. Uh, and, and of course, when you get to circular economy, there's other related measures you're looking at, you know, waste diverted from landfill, maybe liters of water saved in production processes, things like that. But once that impact story is there, we, we can take that hat off. That's where we start. And once we're happy with that, then we put on our VC hat and ask the usual sort of VC questions. Is this a leadership team that's exceptional, that has the determination, the intelligence, the resilience to succeed? I was reading something the other day. It's actually grit and, and uh, <laughs> they 
grit that is the most important of, of those. Um, you know, is there product market fit? We want to see that before we invest. We want to see there's happy customers that are having an important need being filled by the product or service. Um, is it a business model that can scale if, there, if there's sufficient resources in terms of capital and talent added to the team? Like there's lots of great circular economy ideas out there, but some of them are, are, are not really the right fit for BC and that's, that's fine. Like BC isn't for, for everything. Um, and maybe just to the next slide. I'll do one more minute. Okay, I'll be quick. So this one really, this will be the last slide. Uh, and this slide is just, is just highlighting some of the areas and, uh, and, and companies. So food and agriculture waste conversion is a great one. Uh, you know, that's, that's, you know, food waste is a big GHG emission contributor. These companies are taking food waste and turning it into something new. So Alttex is a interesting company uh, that is manufacturing a fiber that's similar to polyester to be used in clothing. They're making it from food waste. Wine Crush is a BC company using waste from the winemaking process to create a puree that can be used as an additive in products such as alternative meat. Then in the uh, supply chain waste reduction, so Felix was talking about wood and his, his friend uh, uh, is the founder of Unbuilders, which is, a, is another great local, local company, deconstructing homes and reusing or repurposing the materials. Uh, Queen of Raw uh, in the textile business software platform to help find a user for textiles that otherwise would be wasted. Surprisingly, a large amount of water used in, uh, in creating those textiles. So, so big, big story in that. Uh, then you have CO2 capture. So of course, we're avoiding CO2 going into the atmosphere using it in products and carbon upcycling is uh, Earthly Labs, um, you know, a small scale carbon capture device that can be deployed at breweries and wineries to capture and reuse CO2 that's emitted through the fermentation process. And then that last category is, uh, of course, where we find shop value and dbrand, waste repurposing and upcycling of, of, uh, of what would otherwise be uh, waste products. So I'll, I'll um, um, pass it back to you, Brianna. Um, thank you, Tom. We're getting to some uh, Q and A. I have a question or two prepared, which will give our audience some time to place their questions in the Huva uh, Q and A. Uh, building where you left off, Tom Felix. I know you just completed another round of capital raising. Congratulations. Uh, what have been some of the largest hurdles for Chop Value in accessing the capital, as well as the keys for unlocking it? Mm -hmm. um, so, so I guess I start with the with the second question. You know, keys for unlocking it is is, is always showing showing a clear path, showing traction, um, and and and. Uh, and, and making sure that there's a, as a reason for, for, for fundraising, right? So, uh, and, and I think depending on the stage of the company, there are different reasons. Um, maybe to briefly go into our journey, um, I shared with you um, when I started, uh, when I had the idea, my first thought was never, how do I raise money? My first thought was, how do I make this work to a scale where it makes sense, period. Yeah, like I, I didn't know, that financing would be the option to go for to scale. But it was a natural decision that I learned throughout the first year in business that I bootstrapped, um, where someone had to really sit me down and say, Felix, asking for money is not a weakness. Um, that's, that, that might be a cultural difference. Um, asking for money is, 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 is a tool for growth. So what if you wouldn't have a financial constraint and how would you would like to grow? What's your vision? And, uh, and then we're talking about the financial strategy behind that. That was my step one. Um, and then obviously now in that latest round, it's really um, you know, being fortunate enough to have uh, such a strong uh, relationship already with, with existing investors who you can pull together back on the table and say, okay, look, this is what's happening. Uh, this is what we're realizing throughout 2020. We see, uh, we see that need of, of more um, sustainable solutions. We, we see the growth. This is our pipeline. And if everything falls into place, we do need operating capital to grow. And uh, that was a compelling enough um, story to really uh, get into that next stage of financing. You know, luckily, few. <laughs> and now we are um, like, we, we're in that next chapter again. And uh, as, as founder um, uh, and as growing team, 
you are now, uh, I, I always like to see it as a, as a ceiling. Um, one of our team members once explained it to me saying, Felix, it's almost like you're now at that next ceiling and there's this little crack and you're really trying to push yourself through this crack to get on that next level. And then you start all over again, just on a different scale. And that's how we're feeling right now. And now uh, there's a lot of room, but I'm already trying to look for the next ceiling. And, and that's challenging every single time. Fantastic and great to hear the progression as well as breaking through all of those uh, different ceilings. Uh, Amelia, as an established business in the circular economy, can you reflect on what you got right and what you got wrong with regards to securing capital over the different stages of business development? Sure, well, it's pretty easy to answer that because we actually haven't secured capital yet. <laughs> uh, so I don't know if we, if we missed out on that, but we, um, yeah, our journey was a little different. Like we, I think what happened for us is because we were, you know, we've been in this for over almost 14 years now. Um, we just grew organically for a long time. Um, and it wasn't that we didn't have offers. I don't think of like, oh, we'd be interested. We really like what you're doing, but we didn't have what Felix spoke about. We, we didn't really know what the clear vision was because it was such an, we were, we were really, we're very, very early. So and I just felt really strongly that until we were crystal clear and where we were heading, um, that I didn't feel comfortable bringing anyone else's money into it, to be honest with you. And so we were fortunate that we were able to grow our small team and just, you know, we made, we were profitable every year. So we just put a little bit of our profits into our business and just slowly scaled up. And I wouldn't say that it was a linear growth always. Like, I, I, I think, well, I guess it actually was, but it wasn't like we had these big bumps. It was just a little bit organic, you know, over time. And I think from a financial standpoint, we reached a stage about two years ago um, where we were like actually just before COVID hit actually, where we really were like, okay, we can see this more clearly. We know what we need to invest in. We know how we need to grow our team. We know we're pretty, pretty bullish in where we think the market's going to go. This is our time. And then COVID hit and we're like, oh, well, that's not, that didn't work. <laughs> so everything, all the retail stores, retailers closed their shops. Um, and we really, we had to kind of sit back and see what was going to happen. We chose the last year to thankfully for the, the government wage subsidy really helped out um, in us being able to continue our, to grow our team. Actually, um, we were hit a little bit and I'd say Q2 of last year, but things started to rebound. A lot of the brands that we work with were very resilient, which allowed us to be, and the market just came to the table. Like it's just, it's, it's huge. And um, a lot of partners, like I mentioned, are starting to come to us and, and really interested in investing in what we're building. And so now is the time. So we're just actually about to enter around um, right now. And we're, we're doing, we're looking at VC capital, but we're also looking at strategic as well um, for our business. And we have some pretty interested parties uh, that I think, I think to Tom's point, strat strategic is really important to us. So I think whether that be, is a VC with the similar ideals that we have, or if it's a, a true strategic partner that can help us scale and grow, uh, that's going to be most essential for us. I think it's it's just about getting, um, I, I think the biggest challenge is knowing like how to, where to invest. And is it, it's obviously in team and in equipment, but how much to, to, to get and, and how quickly. And a lot of times the VCs want to put more money in than you want to give up because you're, you know, you know that your future is bright. And so it's a really is a bit of a balancing act of like, you know, let's make the pie bigger <laughs> for everybody versus saying no to it. It's just like, how do we make this bigger together and, and leveraging some of their relationships? Um, so that's really been our journey. It's been fairly simple um, up to this point. And um, we just did raise some debt. So we went, we worked with BDC and our house bank. So we, we did that recently, which has been great just to keep the equity in house um, for the short term as we grow. Uh, but definitely, um, very imminently, we'll be doing our first round. Absolutely. Thank you, Maria. So many great insights there and great to hear, you know, the alignment with Tom about the importance of having those uh, strategic partnerships and making sure it really is uh, the right fit. Um, Tom, from a capital supplier perspective, where do you see some of the largest opportunities for circular economy entrepreneurs? Um, yeah, I think, I think it's... Um... That last slide I put up, I mean, I mean, in, in very broad terms, where you, wherever you see the greatest waste happening, <laughs> that's that's where the greatest opportunities are for the circular economy entrepreneur. 
And so, yeah, one of those boxes I had, for example, uh, food waste reduction. I mean, there are all, I'm seeing so many companies in that, in that space. There's so many different ways of coming at it, whether it's, it's using like the examples I gave were, you know, food waste uh, being repurposed into something else. But there's also, you know, food waste that is, uh, you know, captured before it be goes into a landfill and goes to feed other people. So Food Mesh is a local company that does that. Or Gooder is a big American company, not, I guess not that much bigger than Food Mesh, but a well-known American company that's doing that. Um, also, just like into other products as well. So, you know, I'll give an example of a company, uh, um, Full Cycle Bioplastics, that's taking food waste and turning it into biodegradable material that replaces plastic. So, you know, imagine, uh, you know, large, large production facility that's, that's making food and, and uh, instead of using, using plastic, they take their own waste from their own food products, put it into the doohickey and out, out of the doohickey comes something they can put their food products in and sell it. I don't think they call them doohickeys, but I couldn't remember what they are. So I went with doohickey. Um, or, or even like, you know, spoiler alert is a company that comes to mind where it's software that, 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 that you know, ensures that in supply chain, there's, there's a lack of food waste. So yeah, it's just finding, it's kind of what, what both Amelia and Felix did. They, they found an area where like, this doesn't seem right. Like, why is, why is this perfectly useful product just being wasted? And then, you know, using some ingenuity to figure out a way to market and sell that and turn it into something new and market and sell it. Thank you, Tom. Uh, now, Meg, I know you've been monitoring our uh, Q&A from the audience. Uh, over to you to pose a question to our panelists from the audience. Thanks, Brianna, and thanks, panelists. I will say, audience, you're really not showing up here. Please post your questions, or we're just going to be putting questions into your mouths on, be on your behalf. Um, uh, something that's come up for me as you each spoke through your journeys and, and your current positions in the circular economy is this question of resilience. Amelia, you said uh, you were lucky at the time of the pandemic that your partners were themselves quite resilient when the economic uh, crash, <laughs> squeeze, um, came through. And I, I wanted to invite each of you, maybe starting with Amelia, to reflect on how you, you as an entrepreneur, and so we're speaking to an audience of entrepreneurs who are just getting into new relationships with partners, investors, clients, how do you go about, you know, identifying or predicting resilience in those potential partners? Hmm. Good question. Um, it's a little bit of a... I don't know. Like, I, I feel like I trust my instincts a little bit. Like I'm just kind of one of those people that I do. I, I don't know. I trust until I am given a reason not to. Um, but when it comes to resiliency, it's, it's really, it's, it's a, it's a bit of a learned behavior. I think, I don't know. Like when we, when we went through our, you know, not through, we didn't go through anything with Dbrand, but as Dbrand wasn't growing the way we thought it would, I would guess you would say. And, and there is, you know, if you read Good to Great or any of Tom, uh, Jim Collins' books, like he talks a lot about what it takes to be like a level five leader. And a lot of it is that like that spirit and that um, tr like that true belief in what you're doing. And so I think if you can put, I've met a lot of people along the way that are in it for themselves, I guess I'll say, and they're in it for the money or they're in it to be successful or, and, and I, I, I think there's a big distinction to me between the word success and significance. Um, so success to me is something that you achieve for yourself and significance is something that can have impact on others. And so for me, I'm always looking at partners and, you know, team members, um, clients even, um, just how they approach meetings, how they show up in terms of looking at the bigger picture and looking at um, just the, the world around them. I, I, like this is our you know, I have this poster on my wall at home that says time, it's all we have and don't, you know? And so I, I think that there's something to be said for like spending your time doing purposeful work and um, resiliency shows up through that. Because I think if you only, if you're just in it for one reason, um, and a lot of times it's financial, I don't think you're going to have the resilience to get through those hard times. And there will be hard times, whether that's financial, personal, this is, this is life and this is what life is about. Um, it's, it's not going to be easy, but if you really believe in what you're doing, I think that's, that will allow you to see that in, in other people around you. 
Great, great answer. Thank you. Felix or Tom? Um, Tom, do you want to go ahead? Sure. I'm just glad like you that Amelia went first on that toughie. Um, so I guess it's a, a little different perspective from the, from the VC world when we're looking at that. Although I would completely double down on what Amelia said about um, trusting your gut about you know reading people. Um, but yeah, one of, one of the first things we care about is looking for values alignment. So, you know, when, when we spend X number of hours talking to Felix before we invest or any investor, it, it becomes pretty clear, um, you know, whether, whether, whether they're, as Amelia was saying, you know, someone who's just trying to make a buck or whether they actually care about the mission that they're on. And someone cares about their mission they're way more likely to be resilient when things go bad and not just give up. So there's that. And then the other thing is, uh, uh, Felix would have had the joy of this. We, uh, Mike has a background as well uh, in, in recruiting and he, he has a very um, detailed founder interview we do. And some of the questions in there, it's probably not the kind of stuff you'd expect. Like there's some out of left field stuff that we ask the founders. And, uh, and it's to try to find out about certain key characteristics that, that people have. And so there's some questions in there that are just like to try to dig down on like, you know, what, what has been done in the past when something went wrong type of questions, right? To, to see if it's the kind of person who just says, oh, well, I guess that's not gonna, gonna be for me. I guess the universe is speaking, I'm just gonna move on or whether they're like, no, this is, this is, uh, this is what I want to do. And when my brother says to me, how are you going to feel whenever someone else does it? You're like, no, no, I can't just walk away. I gotta do it. And, and, and I thought you just generally were interested in getting to know me when you, when you asked all these questions. <laughs> now, now we were probing into the deep recesses of your mind. <laughs> no, um, <laughs> make, make quick, quick response on, on resilience. I think um, again, huge learning opportunity for me to actually understand what resilience mean, uh, resilience means for our, like in our team and for myself um, throughout 2020. Um, I, I couldn't hear the word uh, at the end of the year anymore because everyone seemed to pick up on it uh, and, and, and kind of compare what it meant. But what it actually did to us is just reflecting on our core values. So we, we, we took a breath. We, we, we met, uh, I think, the last possible day where, where, where you were allowed to meet in person, indoors. We went on the whiteboard and we wrote down um, every single customer that bought from us um, the, the, the first three years in business. And we asked ourselves, why did they buy from us? And that's how we came up with kind of the, the top three. And the top, you know, most of them was the story and the impact that they want to have to be part of something. And then we knew, okay, we have to remind ourselves that that's the value we're creating. And that's the biggest part of our resilience story um, uh, in, in, within 2020. And we're only working with the people right now that we know our values aligned and want to grow with us so that no crisis goes to waste, literally. Thank you so much. Excellent question, Mark. I do wanna be cautious of time. Somehow that hour went by so quickly. We just have two minutes left. Um, I invite each of the speakers, if they'd like to say a few uh, concluding remarks, perhaps uh, 30 seconds or less. Uh, Amelia, we can start with you. Oh, geez. Um, <laughs> how do I, um, I think what it, I'll, I'll, I, I'll quote my brother again. I wish he was listening to this. This I have three brothers and it's the older one that gave me this advice. But um, the other bit of advice, I overheard him actually speaking at an event years ago and he was talking to a group and he said, you know, as an entrepreneur or really anyone in life that's trying to achieve something, you sometimes um, shoot for the moon, right? You're working towards something and you're moving forward and you're very, very um, impassioned about that. But a lot of the times you land on a star and that's okay. So sometimes, and, and I guess my point, you can interpret that how you will, but it's, it's really important to recognize that there's opportunities all around us. There's lots of stars out there and you might be shooting for the moon right now, but don't close your eyes to um, what's in front of you. And, and that's where I think true opportunities arise and don't be scared to be transparent and to be, to trust because um, I'd much rather live a life of um, trusting people than, than the opposite. Um, I think it's a much happier and more joyful way to live. So that's me.
Fantastic, Felix. I almost want to use this as a closing note um, because this is this is <laughs> perfect. Um, I, I would I would just say I, I usually tell my team to do more and and talk less, but I I feel like that doesn't translate really nicely. So uh, I guess a better saying is uh, talk less, say more with the words you speak, and uh, that's truly how we live every single day and and make sure we uh, we we truly are part of part of the action uh, on every single thing we do. I'll, I'll just say if, if uh, someone is an entrepreneur on this call and they're, they're getting their, their business started, um, if, you're, if you're listening to this call, you're prob probably interested in circular economy. If you're interested in circular economy, you're probably uh, interested in climate and climate's a big issue right now. And uh, I, you know, Felix said something about, you know, you guys, you guys are came to came to, to 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 this to hear someone like Tom of VC, and I was thinking when you said that, like, actually, I'd rather hear the inspiring stories of people who decided to Amelia and Felix who decided to to, to do something about it, um, and and so I just like would would say, you know, if if you have a dream of starting a business and and you've started it, like, be resilient, stick with it. Um, there's lots of support out there. I'm happy to talk to people anytime, even if, if for whatever way I can help, even if, even if it's not a fit for, for active impact. Uh, I, one thing I love about doing this as opposed to what I did before, which was confrontational, is everybody in the ecosystem is, is uh, trying to you know, raise everyone else's boat and is willing to help. So um, keep doing what you're doing. Perfect. Thank you. I want to thank all of our panelists today. I know I learned an immense amount in this past hour, and I'm sure all of the attendees did as well. Um, to all of the attendees, thank you so much for your time as well. Uh, please don't hesitate to reach out if you have any questions about resources and supports for the circular economy um, startup. And thank you to Vancouver Startup Week for allowing us to host this session. And um, I believe that concludes our session today. And thank you so much for everyone. <laughs>